sermon uh, of the uh, Led by the Spirit series uh, this summer. And the uh, passage of scripture we're reading this morning is from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to verses 40. Let's read those verses responsively in honor of God's word in our hearts. So let's read Acts chapter 8, 26 to verses 40. We read responsively from the English Standard Version. This is the Word of God. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning to uh, returning seated in his chariot and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice is denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and began with scripture. He told him the good news about Jesus. And as, and as they were going along the, the, the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. 38. And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water. Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Azotus, and as he passed through the preached gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Amen. A uh, little bit about myself this morning. Uh, when I was uh, living in Dallas, like 20 years ago. I was just kidding. It feels like 20 years ago. Whenever, <laughs> maybe eight years ago. Uh, I and my family would used to go to a family retreat. Uh, by the way, thanks for praying for our staff retreat. We had a wonderful time, a bonding time, and prayerful time. Uh, me and my family used to go to this retreat, family retreat, after Sunday service to this place called Tyler, Texas. Now, this was about three hours east uh, from Dallas. Maybe Pastor May knows Tyler, Texas. And um, this was where the uh, Youth with a Mission base was, headquarters was. It was called YWAM, right? Youth with a Mission. And the reason we went was because sometimes um, when pastors are tired, a lot of times they're tired, uh, they uh, would want to go somewhere serene, quiet, and just take a break, right? And uh, they offered us housing, the YEM base, YWEM base. Uh, they offered housing for free for pastors for a couple of days to just stay in their rooms and walk around the lakes and ponds and see the wild animals, horses. And so since we had little kids, we went there you know, from time to time and we kind of relaxed and enjoyed. I, f I remember when we first went there, it was in the evening, the uh, ranch, it's a ranch, was so big, we had a hard time finding the entrance to the thing. After we came out from the highway, we had a hard time finding our way to the building uh, within the ranch. Finally, finally found the building, we somehow took care of the dinner, food, and we stayed overnight, we slept well, it was a small room, but it was fine, and we had a wonderful, restful day. Uh, so we did this uh, now and then. Uh, one time, my dad, who, uh, he visited us in, in the Dallas area. And you know, many of you know that he is a seminary professor. And the president of uh, YWAM, 
uh, he's the boss over at the space, invited my dad and myself to visit him. And so uh, I drove my dad. We went together to the YM base in Tyler, got off the freeway, but something was different this time. There was somebody, a staff member, right at the, free, the exit of the freeway, convoying us to uh, inside the ranch. And uh, we didn't go to a, a small room, but it was a mansion in the middle of the base. And we were led to this dinner table. We didn't have to find our way. The dinner was prepared. And the president, uh, Dr. Liren Paris, uh, he personally uh, introduced himself and what uh, YWAM was doing all over the world. Uh, Tyler, Texas is, Texas is where the North America YWAM base is. There are many bases around the world, but you know, Tyler is where the center of the North America uh, ministry is. And so he explained his ministry, and we were introduced to all his staff and the uh, wonderful people there. We, went, we were able to meet them. We truly felt like we were like VIPs, important people, and uh, we had this great experience. Uh, but I was thinking, I've been there many times, but this time it felt so different. Before, I had to find my own way, find the entrance and small in a, stay in a small room. Now we were invited to this mansion, to this meal. We were hosted by the president himself, and we heard the story of how this great uh, ministry of God got started. What a different experience at the exact same place. I feel like as we navigate our lives each day, we can feel like that, that visitor overnight. We're trying to find the place to stay. We're trying to find our own food. We're trying to find our own way. But how different it is when the owner of everything, owner of God, who is God, Holy Spirit, leads us. And we lead ourselves and we pledge ourselves and we try to you know, make a living for ourselves. It's so different from when the Holy Spirit leads us and he shows us and he invites us to greater things in life even though we live in the same place. The experience could be totally different. Those who have been led by the Holy Spirit know the joy and the confidence there is as a person of God. I ask this, I guess, almost every week these days, these Sundays, do you really want to be led by the Spirit of God? That was the actual question, not a rhetorical question. <laughs> do you really want to be led by the Spirit of God? Yes, I do. I do. I don't want to be left my orphaned and try to figure out things for myself, but I truly, we all actually want, we're desiring after, we're thirsting after that leading of the Spirit of God Himself. And we are called the sons and daughters of God, those who believe in Jesus, receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, have the authority as children of God. That's what John 14 says, 1 14 says. And uh, if you are children of God, we are led by the Spirit of God. Romans 8, right here, 14 says that. We are led by the Spirit of God. And as we're led by the Spirit of God, we could experience a totally different quality of life. Although we share the uh, same, you know, the land here with other people, you know, we breathe the same air, we might go to the same schools, the same workplaces, but if you navigate yourself versus navigate, being navigated by the Holy Spirit, the experience is uh, very different indeed. As we go into our story this morning, the question I want to raise and answer is how does the Holy Spirit lead us. We've seen many things about the Holy Spirit this summer, but not really how question up till now. How does the Holy Spirit lead us? Is the question that hopefully is upon all of our minds. As we saw previous weeks, we saw how the Holy Spirit has created from nothing, right? Ex nihilo, from nothing. He created this community of God where they're self-sacrificing, they're sharing their goods, and they're caring for the poor. It's truly a community where love is prevalent, and there is forgiveness, and the rule of God. God's word is ruling, reigning. This was a truly unique community. And the fact is that it was growing by the thousands. 3,000, 5,000 were being added to the number of this amazing community of God that we see in the first time in the human history. If you are the Holy Spirit, how would you navigate this community? What would be the next step of expansion, 
the, you know, Jesus says, go to all over the earth and, and be my witnesses. How could this church expand and uh, truly grow and be an impact, a good influence upon this earth? What actually happened is something that none of us could have imagined. You know, um, was it Mark Twain who said, truth is stranger than fiction? Truly, this truth that, re re that happened afterwards was truly stranger than any fun movie or fun novel could ever imagine. It was tra stra uh, truly stranger than fiction. Because you would think, for the church to keep expanding and growing, you need to have a strong core, key leaders, and you know, a vibrant, healthy community. But what happened was, after last week, after Stephen's persecution and his martyrdom, he died, right? He was killed uh, by the stoning of by the people, angry Jews. The church was persecuted. In fact, everybody was dispersed all over the Roman Empire, except for the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. What, how ironic. When the church was expanding and it was prospering and God was doing amazing things, at that very moment, God split up this church all over the empire. Who would have imagined that this was God's way? You might have imagined, you know, people in the church might have thought, how sad, you know, how devastating this is. We are ruined. We have no future. But for those who were led by the Spirit of God, knew that this was God's way of expanding His kingdom. Since we read in verse 4 of chapter 8, uh, previous section that we haven't read. It says, Now those who, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. As the people went out all over the empire, they started sharing, preaching the words of Jesus Christ to everywhere. And it was indeed expanding. And one of those people who were involved in that spreading of God's words as they were scattered was the character, the main character of our story today. His name was Philip. Last week we saw Stephen's life. He was a uh, dignified hero. Everybody knew Stephen. But Philip, not so much. He was an unsung hero, so to speak. He is the character, main character that the Holy Spirit highlights because he was being led by the Spirit of God. Before we get to our story, we see this Philip going into the city of Samaria, the city, forbidden city. You shouldn't go there as a Jew. But he went there. And he saw a great revival. Great joy was upon that city as they heard the gospel. And many turned their, from their evil ways to worship God through Lord Jesus. And the Spirit of God continues to lead Philip into his next assignment. A very unique and very special assignment. And, and uh, verse 26 that we read this morning tells us an angel of the Lord directing Philip. And uh, we, we find this, uh, this expression uh, synonymous with the Spirit of God and uh, the Holy Spirit. Because in verse 26, an angel of the Lord, verse 29 says, And the Spirit said to Philip, verse 39 also says, The Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. Although it was the angel of the Lord, we know that the Holy Spirit, uh, he commanded the angel to direct Philip. To do something, right? Because this entire story is about the Holy Spirit is in the driver's seat. He's driving the story. He's leading Philip to something that he had never experienced before. We don't know how this messenger of the Holy Spirit spoke to Philip. That's not the point of this story because he doesn't go into detail of, of the method. But we know that Philip knew exactly where to go, what to do. In verse 26, the messenger of God says, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. You, do you have a map uh, for us, Brother David? We find, um, we find, is it there? There it is. Jerusalem, the circle in yellow, the circle, we find there's a road, there's a highway going from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is the Mediterranean city. It's going south, southbound. So the Holy Spirit was telling Philip, Take the J Jerusalem to Gaza highway, you know, specific highway number, and then he's saying, go southbound, not northbound, and go now. You'll meet somebody. So he was very specific in direction and, and where and also when. And Philip 
was obeying the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, with this accurate uh, leading, leading of the Holy Spirit, Philip was able to discover something, right? When the Holy Spirit leads us, we don't know what's ahead of us. Usually, we discover what uh, he has for us. Verse 27, he says, He rose and went, and there was. So, behold, he saw something. He met somebody on the way. We only experience the leading of the Spirit when we obey the Spirit. We discover what the Spirit of God has for us. And there's a lot of element of surprise at discovering this passage. It says a, a black person was there. It was an Ethiopian man. And not only was it just a, just a black Ethiopian African person, but this person was a court official of Candace, uh, was the queen of Ethiopia. So uh, in our passage it says he's a eunuch. He was a hard Kai court official. He was in, ch in charge of the treasury of the country, right? He was the secretary of, of the Department of Treasury, so to speak. He was a very high official, very close to the queen herself. And another important revelation that the scripture gives us was that he was going back to his home from after worshiping God in Jerusalem. Wow, this African was worshiping Yahweh God in the temple of God in Jerusalem. That's very unusual, right? We know that he was a, one of those few God-fearers among the Gentiles. He was not a Jew, but he worshipped the God of the Bible. And another important revelation is that he not only was observing these Jewish festivals and making his way to Jerusalem and back, but he was reading the book of God. He was reading the book of Isaiah. In fact, from all this, we can deduce that he was a foreigner. He was a God-fearing foreigner who was pursuing. He was a seeking seeker of God, of maybe even the Messiah. When Philip discovered this, this uh, eunuch, and he understood what was going on, it was going to change both, their li both of their lives forever. This was not a coincidence. It was strictly by the precise and accurate leading of the Holy Spirit. Isn't this really true? That truth is stranger than fiction. What movie could make such a setting here? And so now the stage of the story is all set. The Holy Spirit has led them together to, to meet together, encounter for a very specific reason. What was that reason for this encounter? We will also discover together. Now the Spirit was more active in, in nudging Philip. And he says, go over there. Go over and join this chariot. Verse 29. And so the Spirit of God pushed Philip very close to this chariot. And as soon as he got close to the chariot, he understood. Philip understood right away what was going on. Because he heard something familiar coming from this chariot. It was a Bible passage that he knew by heart even. It was from Isaiah 53 of how the, uh, the lamb was silent before the shearer and this lamb was persecuted un unjustly and uh, it was treated poorly, abused, and it was butchered. It was about this person who was suffering unjustly. And so he recognized this right away because he knew this by heart. And this was the very passage that the Israelites, the Jewish people, always recited when they were waiting for the Messiah. That these are the things that the Messiah would experience. Although this foreigner, this Ethiopian was reading scripture, maybe broken Hebrew, right? As he was reading it. But he understood what was going on. And so maybe out of just, you know, familiarity with that scripture, Philip had to ask him, do you understand what you are reading? You are a foreigner. Do you understand what you are saying? And so uh, the story goes that the Ethiopian eunuch invited Philip into his chariot. Indeed, um, Philip starting with this passage in Isaiah 53, he goes on and explaining how Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament and what Jesus has done and how he has witnessed the ministry of Jesus. I imagine, you know, as they were riding together on that dusty road, you know, dry, desert place, arid place, maybe as Philip was saying all these things about Old Testament scripture and how Jesus had fulfilled the scripture, it was reminiscent of that exact scene when the two disciples were walking down the way, the road, the dusty road of Emmaus, 
And Jesus explained to them how the Christ, Messiah, had to suffer and resurrect. And maybe with that same passion, Philip, who was now led by the Spirit of God, was sharing the Jesus story with this God-fearing foreigner that the Spirit had put together. And just as when, when the Philip was uh, talking about the last part, that Jesus has fulfilled all the Old Testament by dying on the cross for our sins and resurrecting uh, from, the, uh, from the dead on the third day, just like Scripture, he has been proclaimed the Son of God. And as he said that, he also remembered to, to preach to him that whoever believes in this Jesus will be saved. Their sins will be uh, forgiven and they will be saved. He was remembering exactly what the apostles had been teaching him. But as soon as he finished this sentence, what the eunuch was about to say was something very unexpected, very startling, and very surprising. Again, truth is was stranger than fiction. Because we find the Ethiopian eunuch asking him this question, what prevents me from being baptized? Look, there is a small stream of water here. As we're going the road, we find this stream of water. What, can I, what prevents me from being baptized? What was he saying? He was saying, I want to accept. I want to be one with this Jesus. If what you are saying is true, Philip, everything that you said is truly true. The Old Testament about what Jesus did and how he is proclaimed the Son of God by his resurrection, I want that. Can you show this picture? Because <laughs> he understood baptism is emerging yourself, immersion. When you go for a swim, you know, you cannot swim without putting your entire self, your body, into the water. He understood that I want to be uh, uh, soaked in that person of Jesus Christ. I want him to own me. I want to own him. Because he understood what the Messiah would do. He understood that he needed the Messiah. Maybe, remember, it, it, it uh, reminded him of all the years of traveling back and forth, back and forth, every year from Ethiopia to Jerusalem of the Holy Trail. He was thirsty. He wanted to know God. He wanted to be one with God. He had that eternal desire to have eternal life. Now, when he was told that that eternal life is found in Jesus Christ, he wanted that. Like the person who, bought, who uh, gave up everything to buy that, that pearl of great price. He, would, he did not uh, leave anything to, to achieve that pearl. This guy, this Ethiopian eunuch, was desperate to own Jesus. And so he wanted to be baptized. What prevents me from being baptized and become a Christian myself? And the two people go down uh, and uh, Philip baptizes the eunuch in the water. And as they come up, it says that uh, there was great joy, right? And uh, there was joy and there was confidence that the eunuch had never experienced in his life before. Now, the eunuch and, uh, the, and Philip would, were to never to see them teach to each other again. But it was okay. There was no problem. Because from now on, the Holy Spirit would lead not only Philip, but also this eunuch for the rest of his life. You might think, what's so gr a big deal about this eunuch being baptized, this one person, Ethiopian person, African person, coming to salvation in Jesus Christ? I'll tell you why it's important. Because history tells us that he continued to live as a Christian. He continued to be led by the Holy Spirit. And did you know, Ethiopia is the first country in the world, you know, ever, to proclaim itself a Christian country, Christian nation, in the history of mankind. Uh, before, even before AD 330, when Rome proclaimed itself as a Christian nation, Ethiopia was the first Christian ever to proclaim itself as a Christian nation. Even today, as map of today, we see like northern half of Africa is, is Muslim and Islam. We see the southern half is Christianity. But like an island right in, 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 in the part, on the eastern part, north, northeastern part of Africa, we see Ethiopia, that red where prominent, predominantly this country is Christian because of, of this unit being led by the Holy Spirit. The question that we all want to ask this morning is this. Oh, pastors, this is a lovely story. It's a great ending, but uh, what does it have to do with us, right? Why is this story written for us and passed on to us? 
And how can we be led by the Spirit of God? And uh, for your convenience, I have written those two principles that we can glean from, from this beautiful story. The first is this. The Holy Spirit leads us to His person. His person meaning the person of interest to God who does not know Jesus Christ. Can we say it together? The Holy Spirit leads us to His person. Thank you. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God always leads us to what God wants in him for himself. Just like a magnet, right? You always see a magnet trying to attach itself to a metal, right? Or attach itself to another metal. That is the attribute. That is the character of a magnet. Like so, the Spirit of God tries to always encourage his people to draw near to God. That is what the Holy Spirit does. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of evangelism. The Spirit who is trying to always encourage us to be close to Him. Not only for us, but for the people, important people in our lives. The, his people, His person, just like the eunuch. There are people who God loves so much. And the Spirit of God draws us closer, leads us to those people like magnets for that glorious holy encounter because the Spirit of God wants to lead them as well. You might think the Holy Spirit is a Spirit who leads us to navigate our lives, you know, complicated lives, who emboldens us and gives us courage and gives us the power, dynamis, to do amazing things, which is true. This is true. But we must never forget that the, the predominant, the most important function of the Spirit of God is to save souls. The Spirit of God is the Spirit that gives eternal life to people. That is the major important job of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of God has the same passion as Jesus. Spirit of God is Spirit of Jesus, right? Holy Spirit has the same passion as Jesus himself has. What was the passion of Jesus Christ? Let's read together Luke 19 verse 10. It's on the screen. Let's read it together. Go. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. One more time. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The Holy Spirit has the same mission and the same passion for this world. The Holy Spirit came to seek and to save the lost. That's what the Spirit of God does. So to be led by the Spirit of God means that He leads us to this mission. He leads us to those who are lost. He leads us to his important person. We see Philip reading, I'm sorry, uh, the eunuch reading Isaiah 53. And uh, they had this encounter. What a great opportunity for Philip to share the gospel, to preach the gospel to this eunuch. And Philip grasped this opportunity to, as he obeyed the Spirit, to share the love story of Jesus Christ. Do you have people around you who are desperate, who have this spiritual hunger? So they ask you out of the blue, you think, you know, hey, I know you go to church, can you pray for me? Where would that, Christian come, that, that question come from? You, uh, ask, you hear people asking about the Bible, and maybe they're even reading the Bible for themselves. They're not a Christian, but they want to investigate, they want to know sure how this is the Word of God. Maybe they're reading the Bible. They're asking questions about the church. So how is church for you? How's it working out? They ask questions about eternal life as a loved one, you know, uh, is, in their lives is gone. And they're wondering about what's after life. You get these questions and you see people around you. Have you experienced this? We must remember when we hear these things, that these things are triggered by the Holy Spirit. You might think, oh, that person might be just lonely, I guess, going through some financial struggles. But we must remember that God is working around us, among us all the time. And when we see things that only God can do, we are led by the Spirit of God. What are the things that only that God can do? People do not have a spiritual hunger uh, in, inherently. 
We are sinful people, and we don't want to have God in our hearts. We don't want God in our life. That's our natural, you know, sinful uh, desire, and that's our behavior. That's our natural attitude. That's our sinful, uh, uh, fleshy behavior. But when you see a person that is seeking God, when you are seeing a person who is seeking after holy things, like this eunuch, who have this thirst and hunger to know what's after death, who is wanting that eternal life, who is desiring a, a love that the world cannot give, they're devastated, they're broken. It is then when you know that the Spirit of God is working on them. And how, how come you see that person and nobody else? That's when the Holy Spirit is leading you. The Holy Spirit leads us to His person. Brothers and sisters, I pray that this will be our prayer, that let us be sensitive, like we sang this morning. Let us be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit to His person. Amen? I pray that we'll be sensitive as He shows us, as He reveals to us, who he is working on. And as we put our obedience in that direction, we will experience something that you've never experienced before. I pray that our lives would be oriented, a, a purposeful life, to seek and save lives, just like the Holy Spirit. We need to be, to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit as he does this. Secondly, what lessons do we learn? The Holy Spirit witnesses for us to his person. Let's say this together as well. The Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. witnesses for us, witnesses for us. To, his to his person. So he not only does he lead us to this person, but the Holy Spirit witnesses for us, for this person. The reason that the Spirit of God led Philip to this eunuch was because this person was ready. This person needed a clear presentation of the gospel. When the eunuch heard this gospel. It was not Philip that persuaded him, right? It was the Holy Spirit who gave him confirmation. Yes, what you hear is true. What you uh, learned really happened in history. And it, it uh, moved his heart. And he wanted to, in his own volition, wanted to be baptized, become one, unified with this Messiah that the God had sent on this earth. It was a one-way drive by the Holy Spirit upon the heart of this eunuch. It was not Philip's eloquence or his beautiful, wonderful teaching, although he did contribute uh, as he gave him the contents, right? But what does that mean for us? It means that we do not need to be fair, fearful as we share the gospel of God. Because why? The Holy Spirit works on our behalf. He, he knows who will, he will be saved, and he knows how to save them. All we do need to do is share this wonderful message with uh, faith in the, in the Holy Spirit. Of course, as we share God's message, not all the time, like our story, that they will receive Jesus and want to be baptized. You know, it would be wonderful <laughs> if they would always want to be baptized you know, and receive Jesus Christ all the time. But we know that the uh, Holy Spirit works at His own pace and His own time. And just as uh, statistics, uh, we've asked people who receive Jesus in their life and uh, found out by statistics that it takes about average of seven times for a person to, they need to hear the gospel seven times before they accept Jesus Christ. They hear it, it's kind of new. They hear it again, oh I heard this. They hear it again, it kind of confirms. They hear it again, Holy Spirit turns their heart and changes them and, and hopefully they come to Lord, uh, believe in Jesus Christ. That's what the uh, evangelists say. That's the numbers that's out there. Maybe you are sharing the gospel with that person the third time for them. Maybe it's their, their sixth time hearing the message through you. Maybe it's their seventh time. And they say, brother, sister, I, can I be baptized in Jesus Christ? Therefore, we do not need to be disheartened as we don't see the fruit right away. We know the Spirit of God is the one who brings salvation in their lives. He is the one who witnesses for us His message on our behalf. The last week, um, you know, um, I had the privilege of, of sharing the gospel one more time with the beautiful couple that was with us, right? And uh, I felt a nudging of the Spirit to share the gospel with them one last time. As some of you know, i uh, tried to share the gospel many times throughout the, throughout the past year. And uh, he confessed, you know, to me that 
he cannot believe in God. He cannot believe in Jesus, resurrected Lord Jesus and all that. I told them, this might be our last chance, my last opportunity to share the most important thing that I have, my, the most important thing I cherish in my life. I shared how Jesus, he died on the cross for our sins. And he resurrected on the third day, proving that he is the Son of God. And not only is it in, in scripture, but also it's in history. Just like, you know, uh, Yisun Shin Changun, you know, he made the turtle ship, and we believe it because it's in the record. By the way, there is no actual turtle ship, right? Nobody has seen it. It's, uh, they just figured it out with all the writing. We believe in the turtle ship. I said, it's written in the scripture, and it found the, the proof of the resurrection is found in the history of the church, how the lives changed, how the gospel changed this empire, this pagan, heathenist empire into Christian. We see people give up their lives for a risen Lord. And when, when I shared this, I saw his eyes open wide for the first time maybe. And to make a long story short, he didn't accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior. He was not ready. He said he was not ready, but he was very appreciative. And I could see in his heart that he wanted to believe. You know, I'm not a prophet or nor a son of a prophet, or anything to do with prophecy. But I had this confidence. I told him, I see that you have faith in you. I know God will save you someday, give you that saving faith. And I pray that God would hasten that day that you could become a Christian. And uh, he, he thanked me. I was confident that the Holy Spirit was working in his life. It is not our role to persuade somebody to believe in the gospel. The Holy Spirit, He witnesses on behalf of us. He is the spirit of witnessing and bringing people to salvation. All we do is when we find, when we encounter the, uh, the opportunity that the Holy Spirit brings in our lives and we follow through, we obey what we're told to do. We will see, not only see the leading of the Spirit, but we will experience our lives a totally different world than we experience every day. This place could be heaven. Your workplace could be church. Your home could truly be where the kingdom of God is established. Brothers and sisters, let us live to save lives with the Holy Spirit. Let us live to save lives with the Holy Spirit. Amen? That's what it means to be led by the Spirit of God. To participate in the Spirit's activity of saving lives. I pray that this would be all of our prayers this morning. I pray that our church, Cornerstone Church, would be a, a, a culture, we would have a culture of this prayer. That all of us would together be uh, involved in the saving of lives with the Holy Spirit. And through this, not only personally, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, we experience the leading of the Spirit, but as a collective community of God, we would see God working in our lives. And we would be able to live the impossible when we should be devastated and we should be oppressed and just disappointed. As we are led by the Spirit of God, we will see a different perspective in life. We will see God working in our midst. And that's what we want, isn't it? Let's live our lives to save others with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray.